From So Say We All and KPBS in San Diego, welcome to Incoming, the public radio series that features true stories from American service members told in their own words, straight from their own mouths. I'm your host, Justin Hudnell. Our guest today is Marine Corps veteran, professor of political science, and former California State Assembly Speaker Nathan Fletcher. Nathan very publicly switched from Republican to Democrat after giving a speech in favor of repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell and allowing all persons to serve openly. And he paid for it politically. But he has no regrets, as you'll hear from his interview. It's a very full episode today, so we're just going to jump right into it. Here's Nathan Fletcher. What a South American Mountain Taught Me About Life, Loss, and Politics by Nathan Fletcher. F*** this. I'm laying flat on my back in a small orange mountaineering tent, and I think I'm going to die. My feet are sticking out the front flap. I didn't have the energy to take off my boots. It is well below freezing. The winds are howling, and the snow is blowing in through the tent's opening. I can't feel my fingers. I'm having trouble breathing and have a terrible headache. My whole body hurts, and I lack the will to do anything except lie perfectly and miserably still. Worst of all, this is just the beginning. I'm in Argentina, near the Chilean border, about a week into an expedition to reach the summit of Aconcagua, the highest mountain outside of Asia. After Mount Everest, Aconcagua is the tallest of the seven summits, the highest climbs on each continent. But I'm struggling to advance beyond base camp, which sits at just over 14,000 feet. Depending on the route, climbing Aconcagua doesn't require major skills. I've done more challenging and technical climbs, but this mountain is very high, and intense storms can come out of nowhere. More than 100 climbers have died on Aconcagua. Only about 30% of those who get permits to climb actually make it to the summit. By the time I arrive in South America, let alone set foot on the mountain, I was already exhausted. I just lost a grueling three-month campaign for mayor when a friend who was a climbing guy invited me to fill a last-minute opening. I didn't train for the climb. I didn't know I'd be here just a week earlier. So when the violent winds, bitter cold, and whiteout conditions force all climbers back to lower ground, all of those factors start to feel like excuses. I think no one other than family knows I'm here, so bailing out wouldn't be so bad. Just act like it didn't happen. But as I contemplate giving up, I'm reminded of a poem that has privately guided me for years. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. Written in 1875 by William Ernst Henley Invictus, his comforted prisoners of war, motivated freedom fighters, rallied nations, inspired movies, and even branded my local CrossFit gym. I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. I realize it's time to suck it up. I resolved I would summit this mountain. I wasn't going to let a little storm or a really big one stop me. No more complaining. And this is about more than the mountain. It always is, from the poem Invictus. In the fell clutch of circumstances, I have not winced nor cried aloud. I've never been a complainer, but in the mayoral election, I sure thought about it. In the course of the campaign, I was forced to acknowledge parts of my past and family life when the fell clutch of circumstances wasn't so rosy. They were situations that toughened and certainly shaped me, but I never winced or cried aloud. That meant... I never talked about it, at all. Climbing one of the highest mountains in the world gives you a lot of time to reflect. There's a great virtue in solitude. But in today's world of constant 24-7 meetings, conference calls, and of course Twitter, who has the time? With the bulk of the storm pass, we loaded up and restarted the trek. Hours of solitude, the comforting monotony of one strenuous step after another, It was nice. As I climbed, I reflected on the recent public display of my weakness and the analysis of everything I could have done differently in my life. Despite all that had happened, my mind kept circling back to one thing. When you're in public life, people want to know who you are and where you came from. For years, I boiled my complicated and painful childhood down to something easy to grasp. My dad was a factory worker who became a cop. My mom's dedicated her life to helping abused children and victims of domestic violence. That's true. But my life doesn't fit neatly into a 30-second soundbite. My dad is not my biological dad. My biological father was an awful person. Years of my life when I was young were turbulent, chaotic, and very violent. It was a living hell. 
I never talked about it because I didn't want to complain or be seen as a victim, nor did I want to relive it. I had moved on. So I avoided the topic entirely by substituting my stepdad for my dad and just staying away from situations that got too detailed. It worked for years. I never anticipated this would become a political issue. It started with the local paper trying to get in a cheap shot and publicizing my mom's divorce and custody records, calling into question the roles of my biological dad and stepdad. That set off a feeding frenzy that had reporters calling and visiting the homes of my mom, stepdad, and any living relative they could find. And when the story I had told for years didn't sync with the drama that the media and opponents were creating, I was put in an awful position. Either tell the whole story or risk people thinking I misled them. So my mom flew in and together we sat down for a very emotional television interview addressing everything. I felt no relief in the interview. But after the story aired, there was an immediate avalanche of calls, emails, and Facebook messages. All amazingly positive and tremendously supportive. Most touching were messages from people who had been through similar circumstances. A college student told me how he now was convinced he could accomplish anything. Our stories were similar, and this one conversation validated my decision to address the issue directly. There was relief and acceptance. Don't get me wrong. I still think the people who sought to make an issue of this are jerks. But in the end, they did me a favor. Back to the poem. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. A weight had been lifted, and a part of who I am was out. I could now see that a story I was reluctant to tell because I thought it represented weakness was actually one of survival, perseverance, and tremendous strength. Climbing into Camp 1, I'm feeling better. Above base camp, there are three high camps, marked by scattered tents, rocks, stacked to block the wind, and bags of trash. Lazy climbers are too weak to carry down the mountain. You methodically progress up the mountain from camp to camp. A couple days later, we made the move to Camp 2. The views only got better. One snow-covered peak after another, as far as you could see. Nighttime was absolute amazement. Southern Hemisphere stars without the distraction of any light or air pollution. I've never seen anything like it. At Camp 2, we hit 18,000 feet, and I felt even stronger. I passed our twice-a-day medical check with ease. Again from the poem, Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. Moving from Camp 2 to Camp 3, my mind shifted from childhood to a more recent experience, war. I left for this trip the day after Thanksgiving. It's a perfect day, Thanksgiving. No drama surrounding gifts. You simply have good food. It's perfectly acceptable to take a nap in the middle of the day. And unlike Christmas, there's actually football on television. Growing up, the highlight of Thanksgiving was a family football contest with my cousins. My younger brother and I were very close to our cousins, the Wise family. There were three brothers and one sister. The boys were the three wise men. Jeremy was the oldest and the one I was closest with. Ben was next, and then Bo, the baby. We did what kids do. Rode bikes, played games, camped, had sleepovers. As we got older, we did what older kids do. Chased girls, drank beer, broke things, sometimes each other. I joined the military first, then Jeremy, then Ben, my brother, and finally Bo. All five of us were in military service. As we got older, we went through the things older kids go through, marriage, kids. After September 11th, combat deployments. When you fight in a war, you know people who died. You often see death directly. Given there were five of us who rotated multiple deployments each, I guess the odds weren't in our favor. It was right after the holidays in 2009 when the call came. Jeremy was dead. A suicide bomber killed him. Getting that call is hard to process. It has a, a jarring effect. I pulled the phone away from my ear and I just stared at it. You don't feel anything at first. Nothing. Everything moves really slow, like your brain is stuck in slow motion. Then you think, maybe they got it wrong. War is confusing. First reports are usually wrong. Yeah, but they don't notify families if they aren't sure. Anger, sadness, and finally guilt. Tremendous guilt. 
Survivor's guilt is one of the least talked about but most profound emotions combat veterans deal with. I left the Marine Corps in 2007 after 10 years of service and immediately wanted to go back on active duty. Instead, I went to Virginia Beach to help make arrangements for the service and the burial. It was there in a hotel room around 3 a.m. that I struggled to find words to comfort Ben. The service was just a few hours away and Ben wasn't sure what to say. I had no clue. I suggested 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous. Be strong. I left off verse 14, which says, Do everything in love. I wasn't feeling the whole love thing. Ben did great at the memorial. The shy, sometimes awkward brother who had lived in the shadow of his older brothers stepped up. He was courageous, strong. He stood firm. I was proud of him. Jeremy was gone, but Ben would fill the void. Two years later, Ben was dead. This time, it was a firefight with insurgents in Afghanistan. Imagine a mom getting the call that her second son had been killed. It didn't seem right that fate could be so cruel to one family. I didn't and still don't understand how God's grace and compassion could allow this to happen. Over Veterans Day weekend in the middle of the campaign, and a month before I'd end up in Argentina, I left California to attend the dedication of a football stadium named in memory of Jeremy and Ben. I think about them every day, but the daily dull pain was amplified as I held Ben's son, Luke. He's about the age of my boys. Now he was sitting in my lap as we watched college football and tried to act like everything was fine. It wasn't the memories of war that I was struggling with. It was surviving. Holding Luke, I committed to do everything to ensure the families of those we lost or cared for. That started with spending time with Bo, the youngest and only surviving member of the Three Wise Men. Maybe there was something I could do to try and help the list of casualties of war from growing. A recent study found we we're losing 22 veterans a day to suicide. Helping save one life would not bring my friends back, but it could help ensure another family wouldn't have to go through the same thing. In addition to trying to help returning veterans, I knew I had to make sure that I never took for granted a single moment with my boys. What would Jeremy or Ben give for one more moment with their boys? This all served to reinforce what a precious gift life really is. So many young Americans had their life taken from them, and I was sure I would not waste mine. The morning after the mayoral election, I conceded the race, congratulated both winners, and quoted the poet Virgil, who said fortune favors the bold. I didn't want to say it was a relief because I did want to be mayor and believe I would have done great things for the city. But there's an approach to life by those who've survived traumatic circumstances, childhood trauma, war, or sometimes both, that invites risk. I had given it everything and come up a little short. No one died. I could never be accused of sitting on the sidelines. If you never fail, you are living a cautious and unfulfilled life. My childhood made me stronger. War couldn't kill me, and the pain of surviving hadn't either. I had lost an election, but had publicly confronted a major part of my life, privately worked through the experience of combat and survivor's guilt. I had also been set free from the expectation of political office. Maybe it's the lack of oxygen, but standing at Camp 3 over 20,000 feet above sea level, things seem very clear. The peace I felt after the election makes a lot more sense. From the poem Invictus. And the menace of the year finds and shall find me unafraid. At Camp 3 or High Camp, there's excitement but also nervousness. This is it. From here we go for the summit. At this altitude, you only get one shot at the top. It's well below freezing. The winds are howling. The snow is blowing. But unlike a week earlier, I feel strong. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. It's 4 a.m. I'm out of my tent and ready to go. It's cold. A few hours higher, I'm watching a sunrise while climbing a glacier above the clouds. Each step of this trip has put distance between myself and what I sought to get away from. But each step has also prepared me to return do a great job that gives me a platform to make a powerful impact globally. An amazing wife, two precious little boys, loyal friends, 
and a lifetime of opportunity. Sometimes what seems like setbacks in life are needed resets. Sometimes it takes a few weeks on a mountain to see what really matters. As I crested the rock formation and stood atop the Andes, it was an emotional experience. I had made it. I had survived, overcome, grown stronger. It always is about more than the mountain. It is clear to me from the poem Invictus, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Any mountaineer will tell you that summiting is only half the climb. We made the summit on a beautiful morning and then descended into a storm. I made it down, but the feeling on the tips of my fingers has not returned, making it harder than you think to type this. At base camp, I caught a helicopter out to ensure I made my son's preschool Christmas show. The expedition weight thermals I wore for 16 straight days didn't make it back from South America, but the two-week mountain man beard did. Nathan Fletcher, thanks so much for joining us on Incoming. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Why don't we start off with you telling us about the circumstances surrounding how you came to join the military in the first place? Well, interestingly, right around second grade, third grade, I guess, beginning of third grade, uh, we had had an astronaut come to come to our class, which was the coolest thing. We're in like poor, working class, rural Arkansas, and we had like an astronaut. And I just, I was, I was like, wow, that, I want to do that. And so I had a teacher uh, who was wonderful, and I said, I really want to do that. So we went to the office. She took me to the office like the next day, and we called NASA. Like we literally called, just called NASA in Houston, and they answered the phone. I mean, this is, you know, a different era. And they said, you know, can I help you? And I said, I really want to be an astronaut. And they said, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm in the third grade. Whoever I got, the operator was wonderful. And so they sent me this box of stuff, you know, with patches and experiments. But they said, you should go to the Naval Academy and be a pilot. And that's the best way to do it. And I said, well, do you have their number? And she did. So the same day, then I called the Naval Academy. And someone answered an actual operator. And I said, hi, I'm in the third grade. I really want to come to the Naval Academy. And they sent me a catalog uh, that was their annual thing of, you know, what you need to do. But she also gave me a list. You know, you need to be on our, on our National Honor Society and trying to be senior class president and captain. Of the, and I had all this list. And so I said, all right, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to do all these things. And then around seventh or eighth grade, I was sitting in the, in the back of class with my buddy, Jeff Davis. And he was writing down things that the teacher was writing on the board. And I said, what, what are you writing down? And he said, well, I'm writing what the teacher writes on the board. And I said, well, how can you see that? You can't see that. I would just listen. I would just hear it audibly. And he goes, no, 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 I can see that. I'm like, dude, you can't see that. It's so far away. Well, I, had, I, I didn't have good vision. <laughs> and so I had to go get my eyes checked. I had to get glasses, which crushed my dreams of going to the Naval Academy uh, and being a pilot and then becoming an astronaut. But I still had that desire to serve. And, uh, and so I, I joined the Marine Corps at an early age. You know, when I looked at all the branches, not, not to pick on any of the others, you know, the Marines, the Marines at the time had those recruiting ads that said, you probably can't do it. You, we doubt you're tough enough. You know, you probably don't have what it takes. But if you think you might be the few, the proud, the Marines, and that, man, that appealed to me. And I said, that's what I want. I want that. And uh, so signed up and joined and loved every minute of it, most, most minutes of it, and definitely shaped, shaped my life in a lot of ways. So they got you on the ad campaign before the Dragon. Yeah, remember the guy slaying the dragon? I remember that you one. Know a too. lot of guys yeah. join for the dragon. Yeah, <laughs> you want to slay that dragon, and and I, there is something. I mean, there is something about, and you know, my brothers in the navy, some of my, you know, my closest friends have been in the army. I mean, it's not, I'm not digging on all the other branches, but there is something different about Marines. You know, I remember little things. You know, we'd say if it ain't raining, we ain't training, and like that, the hotter it is, the colder it is, the wetter it is, the steeper the hill, the more you just dig in and you you get in the hurt and you like it and you just stay there. And I really embraced it and. In a lot of ways, I always say being a Marine was, was not who I was. It was what I did. But the two were consistent with each other. You know, that kind of warrior spirit and that desire to confront difficulty and adversity and, and really fight for something that you believe in and be willing to sacrifice. And so it was, it was a wonderful match. And, you know, a lot of days you look back and say, well, I kind of wish I'd stayed in longer. But I, I did 10 years. It seemed like about time to, to move on there. But it's, it's always, always a part of who you are. You know, I, I think there's, there's, there's not a lot more in life you can do than join the military to be willing to give your life for someone else. Um, and in a world where we're so dominated by the self-interest and self-serving and what's in it for me, you know, I'll never forget the conversations bombed out buildings outside Fallujah where we would joke about if somebody threw a grenade in the room, which one of us could be the first to get on it. 
Well, since returning to the civilian world after leaving the Marine Corps, you've been an Ironman triathlete. Uh, if you mentioned in your story, you survived hiking the second tallest mountain in the world, right. Everest. And when I read all of those things, I can't help but connect them to the decision to subject yourself also to the burning trash pit that is politics <laughs> in the last 10 years here in San Diego. Right. Um, and I wasn't myself in the military, I was in the United Nations, but we had a saying in the, the United Nations for a certain kind of individual who would kind of do what you were saying, be quick to jump on the grenade or even chase and create instances. If the, no grenade existed, we called them emergency junkies. Right. And I wanted to ask if you felt like that moniker applied to you, and if not, what do you attribute to your character that can look a lot like it sometimes? So if, if you fast forward from the Dragon ad, which was what brought so many so many folks into the Marine Corps to the ad today, right? The ads that they run today, they say there are those among us who run towards a sound of danger, towards a sound of injustice and oppression and tyranny and towards those in need. And I do think that there's a different makeup and maybe it's shaped by your life and your experience and, and what you've been through where you, you want to do impactful, meaningful things and you want to do things that matter. And sometimes that'll lead you to extreme things. You know, it's, it's hard to get excited about running a 5K. I'm like, well, do a marathon. When you get on, on Denali and you're climbing a mountain that has a really low summit rate and a mountain where people routinely die, you learn a lot about yourself on that mountain. And it really is a chance to test yourself and to push yourself and to get to, get to a point where you don't think you can go any further and then you realize you can. And then you come back to daily life and you apply those same lessons. You know, you push harder for change, you push harder to help people, you push harder to do things that matter. And so I do think that there's a thread that goes through that. I also think there's a thread with people who have survived difficulty in life, whether it's personal difficulty in, in childhood or whether it's going to war. I mean, when you face death and you've been in situations where you were pretty sure you were going to die and you come out of it, you just aren't afraid. There's no sense of like, you want to die. It's not that. It's just, it's just that you want to live a life of purpose and meaning and you want to do things that matter. That's not for recognition. It's this, it's this sense inside of you that, that you have an obligation to live every minute of every day, to be the best father that you can be. I think a lot now about being the best husband that you can be, about being the best friend that you can be, but also about being someone that gives back and you utilize your tools and, and your connections and your talents to try and positively impact other people. And as, as much as that's good for those folks, that's what gets you up in the morning and, and that's what drives you. And so I think if I can't be a Marine anymore and, and be willing to jump on that grenade, then I can be someone who, who tries to go out every day to, with our flaws and our failures and our, our mistakes and all of it, but who goes out and says, all right, how can I, how can I be a warrior to help that kid uh, who needs services to get out of an abusive environment? How can I help that veteran who desperately needs mental health services to, to not take their own life? How can I help that working class family that, that needs a little help up and a little advantage support as, as they go through? And so I yeah, I, th I think that's probably a fair characterization. My, my wife would joke about the hero complex, you know, drive around looking for someone about to jump off a bridge so you can run out there and talk them down. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm wondering, you know, conversely, just to use myself as an example rather than characterize anybody else, you know, when I, when I was in South Sudan, I slept like a baby as a lifelong insomniac. And when I came home to suburbia, the quiet was really for me when I started first if not having difficulties um, chafing against the return, right? right? The quiet was what got to me. What, for you, in your reacclimation to civilian life, was the first that started to not feel so uh, easy? Well, that transition is hard. I mean, it's really, really hard. And I think if we're being honest, it's, it's difficult to replicate that sense of, of team and purpose and meaning when you're literally dealing with refugee populations where you're, you're saving lives you know, on, a, on potentially a large scale, or in our case where we're trying to make communities safer and you're literally tracking high value targets for Al Qaeda and you're catching them and snatching them and you're flying helicopters or, or trucks and blow up doors and drag out Al Qaeda terrorists and interrogate them and people may die and the stakes are so high and you come home, what do you do after that? You're supposed to get a job where you clock in and you clock out and you sit at your computer and send emails and sit in conference rooms. And it's just, it, it's a really, really difficult thing. And so it's hard to make somebody else money after doing so. Well, yeah, because who cares? It's just money. I mean, it just doesn't, like, what, what's the point of that? Right. Um, I mean, you want to have enough so your family's taken care of, but it, it's just hard. How do you get motivated by that? And so what, I, what I've told a lot of veterans when they, when they come back is I said, look, it's hard. It's going to be hard. But hard is what we do. Right? People that have been hardened by life, that have been hardened by war, they've been hardened by loss, 
we do hard things. Soft people do easy things, right? And so, so what you have to do is put yourself in a position where those things that drove you, I loved having a team. I liked being the team commander. I liked leading the team. You know, when you get in the stack to break through the wall, I don't want to go fourth. I want to go first. And so that sense of, of leading the team on a mission that matters, on a meaningful purpose. And so I tell a lot of veterans when they come back, as I said, you have to find some way that you do that, right? You have to find some aspect of your life that's purpose. And, and maybe making money is your thing, and maybe you give it away to do good, or maybe, I don't know, but everyone's got to find their thing. For me, it's been creating a team, having a mission, having a purpose, and a worthy, righteous, noble fight. And in that fight, you aren't afraid of opposition. I mean, at the end of the day, if whatever you're proposing or suggesting or whatever you want to do, if no one opposes it, it doesn't do anything. So pick those righteous, bold fights that you think matter, and then you go out and you fight them and you win, and you're not afraid to lose. Because losing in a political contest or in a policy issue, it, nobody dies. Then you just regroup and you come back and you fight again, and you keep driving until you get it done. And so I think the vets that I've seen that have most successfully transitioned have figured out how to do that. They start a program that's training vets for meaningful employment. They're involved in mentoring them. A lot of veterans have been great teachers. They're training the next generation about a spirit of service and a commitment about things, and they can see the tangible results of what they do. Some of the veterans we've had on this show and who are friends with me have, have said in different ways the sentiment that a difficult, if not outright abusive childhood is sometimes one of the best recruitment tools the military has, especially right. in infantry roles. The team seems to connect to that. Right. You've mentioned in your story your own abusive childhood, and I was wondering how that helped and maybe complicated your relationship with the Marine Corps during your advancement up through it? So I had never talked about it in my whole life. Looking back on it, I, I don't think that was particularly healthy. I don't think it was particularly good. You know, you create this kind of picture of perfection and you just put it out there and it's, it's not accurate with who you are. And you were also um, protecting yourself and your family. And your family. And, and you never want to be seen as a victim. And then when you're confronted with it, in this case, through a political campaign, it's distorting things and pulling things out and you talk about it. You come to realize that there are a lot of it when you spend some time and you think about it that are incredibly instructive. And our life experiences shape us and they make us who we are. And they give us our strengths, they give us our weaknesses. But at the end of the day, that's who you are. And that's okay. As I look back on it now and I think about military service, it was definitely a benefit. Because when you talk about being a survivor, when you talk about resilience, when you talk about that ability to get up and confront difficulty every single day, when you were shaped at that at the earliest possible age, I mean, I mean, what percentage of the population can go to war and go to combat and have that not be the hardest thing they've been through in their life? Right. And, and, and I think in a lot of ways that was a tremendous benefit. I think it also, you know, there, we, could, we could psychoanalyze what goes through all of this, but there, there's a, maybe a chip or a drive to prove your worth, and you do that by doing things that matter and by having a positive impact. I think in a lot of ways, it made me a better Marine. I think in a lot of ways, you know, I always tell people, you didn't choose it and you would never want it on anyone else. And, and my childhood drives me deeply to, to care about kids because there's such an innocence with kids. And kids are made to pay for the decisions and mistakes of adults. And I would never want any kid for one day to go through what I went through for years, but it drives you to fight for them as well. You know, both of my boys were adopted through the system, and we continue to push in a meaningful way when the system has failed you, when someone should have come and got you and taken you out to try and make that system work better and to provide more help and assistance for kids. So I think in all aspects of life, you take your life experience, you confront it, you're honest about it, you become authentic about it, and then you figure out how that experience makes you stronger, more resilient, more perseverance, more willingness to confront difficulty, and less afraid. And, uh, and I, I, think, I think it, uh, it works out. When you were deployed in the Sunni Triangle during your, uh, during your work with the head team, a notable role you played in the counterintelligence was building relationships with the local populations. Mm -hmm. Now, outside of the training you obviously received in the Marine Corps to fulfill that role, what did you draw from in your personal uh, experience to be an effective intermediary and bridge that cultural divide you must have faced? Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of times in the human intelligence sphere, you get recruited. It's not something you apply for. I was one day just being a Marine, I think I was outside the armory cleaning weapons. And I had done a lot of work in some reserve time in the developing world. I went to Cambodia and Serbia and East Timor where I was monitoring human rights violations. We were doing democracy building and training and election violence type work. And I'll never forget this master sergeant came up to me and he said, hey, are you that, are you that Marine 
uh, they, there was an East Timor wandering around the villages in Cambodia. And I said, yeah, that was me. And he said, you should come with me. We want to talk to you. And so I went and he, you know, he said, you know, we have this program and here's what it does. And would you be interested? And I said, oh, that'd be great. You know, you have to be incredibly comfortable in any environment, in any situation, talking to anyone. And I think a lot of it stems from growing up in a small town. I grew up in a tiny little town in Arkansas. It was called Smackover, Arkansas. It was actually like Sumac-Cover. It was French and no one could pronounce it. And so they merged them together and we had 1,100 people. Uh, I think we had 42 people in my graduating class. We had one stoplight. But in a small town, you talk to everybody because you know them or they know you or they know your cousin or they know. And, you know, you'd be walking down the street and you'll wave and people will wave back and, and, and it's just different. And, you know, in a small town, you don't cut people off for a parking spot because you know them. You're probably going to sit with them at church. You just get very comfortable in, in that environment and you talk to people regardless of their race or their class or their ethnicity. That was helpful. Can you walk into a a random village in the Sunni Triangle or the Somali border, uh, and then can you simultaneously go into the command center and, and brief generals and, and heads of other agencies? My upbringing in a lot of ways was, was very instructive in terms of that willingness to just talk to people and understand that everyone intrinsically has value. I think in a lot of ways now we tend to live in these self-isolating uh, silos of people just like us that look like us, that talk like us, that, that make the same amount of money that we make, have the same background in education. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think as a society that's healthy. And so I think in a lot of ways growing up in a, in a more open and diverse way was, was really helpful. Back when you were a member of the Republican legislature in California before you changed party affiliation, um, you gave a speech advocating for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell when it was still in. And it, it's been regarded as one of the more important moments in that cultural shift and the fact that you went against perceived party lines and maybe even suffered within the Republican Party to make that choice, I think, played a big role into it. I'm going to play a clip for that right now, just in case our listeners missed it back in 2010. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, This is an issue that stirs up a lot of emotion and a lot of passion. There's no doubt that there's reasonable and well-intentioned people on both sides of it. It's complicated, it's complex. It has competing emotions, intentions, and implications. I've seen the impact of this policy directly. I served in the United States Marine Corps for 10 years during the implementation of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I served on American soil. I served on foreign soil. I served in humanitarian missions, in peacetime missions, in combat deployments. I served in times of peace and I served in times of war. I fought in the Sunni Triangle region of Iraq in 2004 during one of the most violent and dangerous periods of that entire conflict. And I want to stress that you do not need to have served in military, you do not need to have served in uniform to have a heartfelt or deeply convicted position on this issue. But I think that my experiences give me a unique perspective that I want to share. My time in the Marine Corps was a remarkable one. I served with some of the finest individuals you will ever meet. I saw people make tremendous sacrifices, some of them making the ultimate sacrifice. I grew to love the Marine Corps, the military. I liked the people, its culture, its way of life, its good order and discipline. Things start on time. You move efficiently from point A to point B. You can imagine as a legislator, I often miss my time in the military. (laughs) But there are also unique circumstances of military service and military life, in particular combat environments that require special consideration. What might work or be acceptable in the private sector or in government doesn't always work in the military or in combat. In the Marine Corps, we tried to define these special characteristics, these core values, the foundation of what it takes to be successful in these difficult environments, in these challenging circumstances you find yourself in. We tried to define them. The Marine Corps, those core values are honor, courage, and commitment. That's what it takes. Having those three, plus a willingness to risk your life for your country, for your fellow Marine, 
It takes a very special individual, and it's not an obligation that should be entered into lightly. And so I believe that any American that has those core values of honor, courage, and commitment, and any American that's willing to risk their life for their country should have the opportunity to serve openly and honorably. And I rise today in support of this resolution. I didn't think the policy of don't ask, don't tell made sense when I served in peacetime. I didn't think it made sense when I served in combat. And I don't think it makes sense today. There's nothing in someone's sexual orientation that affects their love of country, that affects their patriotism, that affects their commitment to their fellow Marine or servicemen or our great nation. And there's certainly nothing that affects their ability to give their life. Indeed, many already have. We need to recruit and train the very best of our society for military service. The strongest, the smartest, the most committed, and the most dedicated. And it's time we remove the barrier that stops some of our amazing individuals from serving openly. I support this resolution, and I hope the federal government will work with military leaders to change this policy. It's the right thing to do. It's time. Thank you. We're back with our guest, Marine Corps veteran, professor, and former California State Assembly person, Nathan Fletcher. I think from hearing that, your reasons for supporting the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell are clear, but then a few years later, you go on to pen an editorial for the Huffington Post advocating for the opening of all roles, including combat, uh, to women's service members. And now here we are. It's 2017. All of these things have come to pass. We have a military that is more inclusive, at least in policy, Uh than half the country is about things like bathrooms and employment discrimination. And so I wanted to ask, what signal do you think this sends to service members right now who are considering joining or are in the service right now about the difference between what they're doing to serve their country and what their country's respecting of them as individuals? Well, it was interesting. That debate, to me, wasn't partisan, and it shouldn't have been. Now, it did reflect, I think, the beginning of the end of my time as a Republican. The backlash on that was was intense. But it was, was also the beginning of my time. It was one of the first legislative actions I was involved in and, and was very eye-opening to me about the Republican Party of today and my inconsistencies with their values. Not all Republicans, but certainly the, the party as a machine. But what I never understood about that debate is that there's a basic moral premise that says your value is intrinsically who you are as a person. Right. And in the, in the Marines, we talk about honor and courage and commitment. And what we talked about earlier, that willingness to give your life for someone else. And none of that has anything to do with your race, with your gender, with your sexual orientation, with where you came from. I mean, none of it has anything to do with that. And so I could never wrap my arms around when I was a Marine. I thought, don't ask, don't tell was the dumbest policy in history. How do you have a policy that says lie about who you are when you're supposed to live a life of honor? And it made no sense. And I I said this in the thing. It didn't make sense in peacetime. It didn't make sense in training. It didn't make sense in war. It never made sense. But you have this old guard that's from a different generation that views things differently. And this is what I was saying when you got to be willing to fight a righteous, bold fight that you believe to be right. And what I think gets lost in the don't ask, don't tell debate today, because now we look back and say, well, of course that made sense. But at the time, the commandant of the Marine Corps said, Marines will die. If you change this policy, Marines will die. And that is a serious thing. That is a serious thing for someone to say, your actions will lead to people dying. And they had this letter that had been signed by a bunch of old generals that said, oh, 250,000 people or something will leave the military and it'll destroy them. And you got to stare that down and you got to say, no, that's wrong. I don't believe you're right, right? My values and my judgment and my assessment of the situation lead me to believe that I'm willing to take the risk that what we are doing is so fundamentally wrong. And that I don't believe that'll be the outcome that happens. Now, if that was the outcome that happened, then it would have been devastating for anyone to take that position. But you had to be willing to take that risk and to confront that. And what did we see? A year later, the commandant of the Marine Corps on page B47, buried in the back of the paper, was asked, you predicted 200,000 people would leave. No, nobody left. There were no disciplinary issues. No Marines died. 
the simple reality is they got up the next day and said, you are who you are and what we value about you as a team member is that, that commitment and that willingness. And so we broke through that barrier and we shattered that myth that it mattered. And I think in a lot of ways that set the stage for women in combat. And when I came out on women in combat, I told my own story. I was in a, in a job that was combat arms. We had no women. And I said, and it was a detriment to our mission. I needed women. Women bring a tremendous, a tremendous perspective and access. And, and, you know, in a lot of places in the Arab world, the women will only talk to other women. I could tell with their eyes they wanted to talk to me, but they wouldn't do it. I needed a woman human intelligence collector with me. And I said, it doesn't matter. You could be a Navy SEAL and you can be an Army Ranger and you can be a PJ and you can drive a sub as long as you meet the same standard. Who cares? And the arguments we saw against women in combat were identical to the arguments that we saw against LGBT members serving openly, which were identical to the arguments we saw against blacks. I mean, there is a thread throughout these things. And when Harry Truman in 1948, he did Executive Order 9981, and he, he desegregated the military in 1948. Now, to put this in perspective, 1948, we were still living under Plessy v. Ferguson, separate but equal. Segregation was the constitutional law of the land. And Harry Truman integrated the military six years before Brown versus Board of Education did away with that and 16 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And the military was a pioneer. And you know what happened when they desegregated the military? Nothing. Because your intrinsic value is who you are as a person and what you're willing to do. And so I think that there's a very progressive record through the military of breaking down these cultural barriers before anyone else does it. And I think when people see, wow, look at that. A member of the LGBT community and a straight person can serve side by side and love their country. Across the board, we can treat people on the basis of, of what they contribute and their values uh, and not hold against them, their race, their gender. And so I think in a lot of ways, uh, the military has been a pioneer. And it's one of the things that really makes me proud. So I'm a child of the 1980s, and I grew up in Top Gun, San Diego, the Red Dawn era of mm -hmm. movies and cinema. And... Back then, there was a distinct conservative vibe that ran in association with the military with me, whether it was how it was portrayed in movies and the media or in politicians. And since then, I've noticed, I think it's safe to say that no one political party can any longer claim ownership over veteran culture or the military. Right. It's kind of up for grabs, right. state by state, county by county, seat by seat. So for you, what values and points and philosophies do you think are most instrumental in resonating with those blocks? And I know there's no one veteran, and I know there's no one service member, but as a block, I'm wondering, what do politicians need to think about to try to win them over in the voting booth and in policy changes? I think my own, my own experience, I think similar. You know, I joined the military out of a kind of poor working class culture but a very conservative culture. And then I joined the Marine Corps, and that was also pretty culturally conservative. We've seen a shift and an evolution in, in today's world. When you look at the military and you look at a lot of the values that are, that are held dear, a lot of them are very progressive values. We don't have segregated military schools, meaning that the, the rich members of the military don't go to one training center and the poor ones go to a different one. Everyone goes to the same. We also have a culture where what your parents did is... is borderline insignificant. You know, a Colin Powell can become a general, and that's, that's not really profound because it is based on your contribution on how hard you want to work and where you want to go. And so it is, it provides tremendous upward social mobility for people that are willing to work hard. And everybody gets, gets a fair shot. Everyone gets a, a level playing field. And so I think in a lot of ways, there's a lot of those values that the military holds dear that in today's world would be considered more, more progressive. I'll give you an example. I talk a lot about this. I'll never forget being at Bridgeport, the cold weather survival school. And it was one of the harder military courses I did. And we're up in the mountains. We've been up there for, for weeks and we haven't had hot chow. You know, we're eating cold MREs and it's freezing, it's snowing. And we see the trucks coming up. They have the Humvees with tracks on them and they're coming up. And we realize it's hot chow and we're so excited. And I was a low, low ranking Marine. So they said, get in line to eat by rank. And you know who ate first? The lowest ranking Marines ate first. The officers ate last. And I was a low ranking Marine, it was great. I had hot chow, it was wonderful. But you know, the privates ate and then the Lance Corporals and then the Corporals and then the Sergeants and the Staff Sergeants. And around the gunnery sergeants, they ran out of food. And that meant everyone above them ate cold chow. Because there's a basic sense that you take care of those you're responsible for. And then you go and you look at today's 
kind of a lot of dominant maybe corporate culture, which says you take care of the people at the top, right? And you don't take care of the people at the bottom. And you look at things like CEO pay. You know, when I was born, the average CEO made 25 times the average worker, which that's fine. I think the generals probably make about 25 times the average enlisted person. But now it's gone to 350 times. And, and, and there's not a sense that you have an obligation to take care of those you're responsible for. And this is part of my own journey and experience, and it doesn't reflect all Republicans. But when you look at the fact of who, who seems to, to be the primary driver of creating combat veterans and who seems to be, bear the primary responsibility of caring for them when they come back, and you see one political party that will you know, be, be very clear about going to war, and then the other party that's pushing the GI Bill of Rights and more funding for the VA and more mental health services. And so in a lot of ways, I think you've seen somewhat a, a progressive shift or maybe a progressive opening for veterans to say, you know, a lot of the, the radicalization of the Republican Party has not been good for veterans. One of the things I think that is, is most disturbing is when it comes to, to gun safety. You know, General Pete Corelli, uh, who is a champion and a warrior as vice chair of the Army for veterans struggling with post-traumatic stress, fought massive battles with the NRA because he wanted to counsel veterans who were in the military, who were on base, who owned private firearms, who were having mental health issues. And all he wanted to do was counsel them. And they literally put in place a provision, which Congress passed at the backing of the NRA, that says you can't ask them if they own a firearm. He wasn't talking about taking them away. I mean, it, it, and it's just stunning when you see these things that tie to, to mental health, when you see what's going on with climate change. The Department of Defense came out and said climate change is the number one threat to national security because it creates global instability, which leads to war. And so when you have a, a segment of society that says, well, it's not real, you know, these are things that continue to weigh on veterans. And nobody wants peace more than someone who's been to war. And I'll never forget this. This was a part I got very involved in the Iran deal. And I literally sat with President Obama and John Kerry and combat veterans, and we said we should have a military and we need to be a force for good. And we always need to be prepared because there are things worth going to war for. But, man, you should try everything else first. I mean, you should try everything else first. It should be the last resort. And I think that even now in today's world, you see a real sense where we seem to have a rush to armed conflict around the world. And I think there's a lot of veterans who are proud of their military service, who are proud of the military and what it stands for, that, that want to have peace through strength, and that doesn't mean that you rush off and go. And so I actually think it's shifting, and I think you're seeing a lot more shifts towards the veteran community being more aligned and more in tune uh, with some more progressive values and, and, and a change that, that, that's happening there. And then part of it, too, is the demographic divide. The military is over-representative uh, of communities of color, of people who come from lower-class backgrounds and working-class backgrounds, um, which also lead, leads to a different shift. So I, I, I would agree. I, you can't overly categorize, but I, I don't think it's fair for someone to blanket say, well, the military and veterans are, are a very conservative, Republican-aligned entity. I, just, I, don't, I think it's much more complex than that. I'm wondering, you know, on that note, since I think it's around 0.04% of the country serves at any given time, according to the last stats I saw, mm -hmm. It reminds me of this, the conversation in this term, the rise of the warrior class, this mm -hmm. idea that there is a certain kind of individual who ends up joining the military, or the military is comprised of a certain kind of individual. And different perspectives have different stereotypes around with that. It's poverty, it's you know, urbanization, it's ruralization, it's whatever you want to say. Exactly right. So what concerns you about having this kind of small group, the small yep. segment of the population do all the heavy lifting? When you look back... Uh, in history and you know the greatest generation in world war ii is the one that that gets the the most attention but there's a number of historical examples but when we launched into that effort fdr took a whole nation to war and the nation bought in and the nation sacrificed people went to work in factories people bought war bonds huge numbers volunteered to serve those who didn't volunteer to serve participated domestically in support of the war and so you had a country that believed in the country and they believed in what they were doing uh, and they collectively were a part of that effort. And you contrast that with the recent wars where literally the message was, hey, don't let this interrupt your life in any way. Go to the mall, get on an airplane, travel, live your life, do whatever it is you would normally do and don't worry about this. And I think that that has long-term implications and consequences because we have to care enough about our society where everyone's willing to sacrifice. And that doesn't mean that everyone has to go to war, but that means that everyone has to be a part of the effort. And when you don't get that cultural buy-in, then you create these mass divisions and you create this sense of isolation 
where literally you're at war for the 12th, 13th, 14th year, the longest wars in the history of our country. Afghanistan is the longest war America has ever fought. Iraq is the second longest war. And it's not healthy and it, it, it's not good. And this is one of the reasons why I've had a tortured relationship with the concept of the draft. Because I feel there's a part of me that says in a democracy, if you can't sustain a military force, then that's what we call an indicator, uh, that there's not popular support for the effort and people haven't bought into it. But on the flip side, the Vietnam War ended because of the draft. Because the reality was in Vietnam, even though we had much higher troop presence, every family had to think about their kid going. Minus if you had bone spurs in your feet and you could get five deferments. But, or blue blood, right. <laughs> or, yeah, exactly. But almost every family, they had to think about it. And so even if your kid wasn't currently serving, you were worried about your kid going. And that created a public engagement and that, that ended up ending a unwinnable war before it drug out even, even longer. And I don't think we have that today. And so we do have this, this isolation of, you know, much less than 1%. The other problem that concerns me greatly is the privatization in a lot of the functions of war, where we just outsource it. And we outsource it to contractors. We outsource it to other countries. We outsource it to folks who are there, who are inherently decent people, but the motive is different. They're there to make money. And Marines are there out of a sense of honor and courage and commitment and belief. And I think as a society, when you combine that with the fact that we're becoming more isolated, we have less a sense of who we are as a people. People seem less inclined to sacrifice for anyone else. Um, I think it's, it's erosive to our culture. And I think at some point we have to figure out a way to get back to a commitment to America. And I think in a lot of ways you see this coinciding with what I think is one of the most troubling things, which is the decline of, of the American dream. And the American dream to me just says if you're willing to work hard, it's, you're not going to have equality of outcome, but you're going to have equality of access. Everyone's going to have a shot at success. They're going to have a shot at working hard. And if you work hard, you're going to be able to move up the ladder. And when you see in the last 10 years that Americans are working harder and longer and making less money and the average wages of American workers are going down, when you continue to see the, the divide in the, in the um, success of public schools, you know, public education is that equalizer. Every public school is supposed to be equally good and give every kid an equal shot at success. And when you see the disparity between reading levels and communities of colors and others, and you see the, the rising growth of income inequality, I think it should be a wake-up call to a lot of us that says if we lose what makes us unique and special as a country, then we're going to lose what people are willing to sacrifice for. And I think you see that erosion, and I think that's something that we all need to be very mindful and very vigilant of and really get up and think hard every single day about how we do our part to make sure that this is a country worth fighting for and to make sure that what I was handed— you know, my, my stepdad was my father figure, never did a day of college in his life. My mom never graduated. We were a working class, but I knew I'd have a better future if I worked hard. And I had a good public education. Uh, I was able to go to college. I was able to do these things. And we can't lose that. Every American child has got to feel that they have that same opportunity and that this is a country that's unique and special and affords opportunities that you're willing to sacrifice for. This might be our last question before we go. From our brief time knowing each other, Factoring in that you're a political animal, you've been a Marine, you've had a lot of very public endeavors under your belt, that you might, as a side effect, be kind of a difficult person to truly get to know under right. the skin. <laughs> and I, I was thinking about this in preparation for, for our talk today. I was wondering, what are the indicators for you that allow you to be vulnerable and to open up and to kind of embrace those quiet moments we were talking about earlier that yeah. sometimes we run from, sometimes we climb mountains to get away from, right. or toward. But what for you are the places that kind of let you find that quiet place and really go shed the armor that is necessary right. for any life, much less one as confrontational as one in politics and in the military? In a lot of ways, this is probably the area where I've, over the last, say, 10 years, really thought about the most. And I think there was a time, particularly early in my political career, where, you know, I alluded to it earlier, but there was this sense of, of you had to project this perfection. And it was easy to try and say, well, this is the box I'm supposed to fit in, and this is the box that other people want me to be in, and the expectation that I should meet, and the things that I should do, and the way I should present myself. Is you really confront the overwhelming survivor's guilt of your, your friends who died and, 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 and the, the very real impact it has on you as you're forced to very publicly confront a turbulent and violent childhood. I mean, some of my closest friends, I had never talked about it, ever. You, you, you come to a realization that at the end of the day, what matters in life is more 
not honoring the commitment to be what you think other people want you to be or to fulfill some expectation that others have put on you, um, but to really be true to yourself and to be comfortable with that. I have a lot of faults and, and flaws and have made a lot of mistakes, and there's things that, you know, looking back, you learn from and you would have done different and better. Um, but I think that through all of that, you get to a place where you're more authentically comfortable with who you are, your upsides, your downsides, and you just embrace that. You know, you need to be authentic and candid and real and admit when you made a mistake, admit when you changed your mind. I have an amazing wife uh, who I adore and I love. Uh, I have amazing kids and I have great friends. You know, I have friends that I went to war with and I have friends I went through college with and I have friends I went through things with. And they're really the people that know you. And those are the relationships that will outlast any political office. When you get to the end, what matters is, is those your kids and your wife and your true friends. And so as I go through life, you know, those are folks who their criticism I take as valid because they know me. And so I listen to that. The rest of it, you just you kind of get to a point where you just discount it and you don't worry about it. And, and you're comfortable with who you are and you're comfortable with where you are in life and you're comfortable with, with where you focus on. And so I think having gone through childhood, war, tough elections, you know, nonsense with political parties, you arrive at a point uh, where you really feel uh, emboldened and comfortable and at peace with whatever outcome may be. And the one thing that you have to be is true to who you are. My journey has been a good one. I tell folks life goes through ups and downs, but when it's good, just enjoy it and go with it. It yeah. reminds me of when you were talking to me about your day schedule. You start off running from nonprofit A to nonprofit B to the studio to have an interview with me, but you get to end your day at a Little League game. Yeah, with my kids, my sluggers. Right? Yeah, and you know what really matters is they say, hey, Dad, you know, you were a good dad. You loved us. You took care of us. And if I can demonstrate through my life, if I can honor my friends who, who didn't get a chance to live another minute of their life, I honor them by living my life, by trying to impart to my kids the lessons and wisdom you know, by loving my wife, by trying to live a life that's an example of service. And in a lot of ways, you honor them by being true to who you are. That, that's all I know to do. Nathan Fletcher, thanks for being on the show, man. It was fun my talking pleasure. with you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care. That's our show. Incoming is produced by myself, Justin Hudnell. Jennifer Pepperpot Corley is our editor and sound designer. At KPBS, Kurt Conan is our audio engineer. John Decker is director of programming. Emily Jankowski is technical director. Lisa Morissette Zapp is operations manager. And Nate John is our innovation specialist with a dedicated purpose. Music used in the scoring of Nathan Fletcher's story, My Time on a Mountain, was by Calaplucci, Chris Sabrisky, Vortex, and VicNet. Support for Incoming comes from the KPBS Explorer Program, the California Arts Council Veterans Initiative in the Arts, Cal Humanities, and supporting members of So Say We All. Learn more about us at our website at sosayweallonline.com. Subscribe to us if you aren't already on Apple Podcasts, and please, please do leave us a review. It helps us enormously. And we'd love it if you drop us a line via email and share your thoughts and stories with us at info at sosayweallonline.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk again soon.